Hey there, hi and welcome to this live Q&A session on effective keyboard layout usage. I hope you're looking forward as uh, well as I, uh, as I am and I hope you're doing well in this uh, crazy time. So this is another um, live session. I hope we have a lot of interaction. We got a few questions on this topic and also I'm just curious, you know, how your reaction is uh, on this topic in general uh, because it's it's just um, something that a lot of developers would not uh, probably not see as their main um, well main topic to focus on right we typically uh, look into things like you know like quality or how to do uh, testing how to do code reviews and all these things so um, let's look into the questions before I do that we have this uh, slido uh, again actually let me again post something into uh, the chat And um, you can go to uh, the slido.com uh, and then you can enter the, I'm just typing that in, F, um, the effective keyboard, effective KDD key. And then uh, on Slido, you uh, can ask questions there directly. So that's faster. And also I prepared some polls, some live uh, polls uh, there for you. That's always uh, some fun. All right, anyway, so let's look into um, the topics and some questions uh, that are already uh, out there uh, on GitHub. So I um, posted some questions that are received directly. Let's refresh refresh this and let's have a look into that. So I hope you watched uh, this video course as the uh, homework and I hope it was helpful or you got some um, yeah, in uh, interesting experience with that already. Feel free to uh, comment that. And I got some questions here by Twitter. What is your take on browsing a website? Should I make use of all the keyboards uh, shortcuts uh, as well? I use the mouse for that a lot and I don't know if I'm much faster. I'm using Chrome. Um, yes, so that is, let's make this bigger. That is really a good question. If we um, look into the browser usage, um, of course you can do a lot of things with the keyboard and there are like hacks available where you can have a Vim-like setting, you know, like where you can switch browser tabs and navigate around and even get some, some highlights. Actually, um, let me uh, show this, Sebastian, on my website. So for example, there is uh, some ways around where I can just press a key, like this is F, and then I can, you know, like, uh, go to some links and say, well, go to this one and so on and so forth. And now see some, you know, um, uh, I don't know, videos there, uh, for example, and, and follow this. So that's uh, a plugin that you can um, use just to get a little bit faster. But of course, um, it depends whether, you know, you just don't want to use your mouse. So um, basically what I would say, um, how I see it always, if you have a limited set of actions, uh, where you could perform uh, them using the keyboard or using the mouse. If these set of actions are limited, then the keyboard makes more sense, right? If we have, um, for example, just a few actions that we would perform, like, you know, typing uh, something or uh, some specific shortcuts in the IDE and things like that. But when we navigate a website like here, it's a little bit more exploratory, right? We might not specifically know upfront where we want to end up, right? I might click here or click there. And then it's, it's not, you know, as straightforward as um, when we navigate in a program that we know well. Um, I would say um, what my take on is just see what works for you. I definitely would not, you know, bother learning all of the shortcuts unless you really use them. What I really uh, enjoy using is uh, Chrome with uh, all the uh, control commands. So you can have, you know, like control T for a new tab. You can control W for closing a tab. Uh, control shift T for last tab and things like that. So the most important ones. And of course, switching tab uh, with um, control tap and control shift tap so i think these are the most you know helpful ones and also the good news is if you do use these then your right hand if you're right handed a right handed person uh, is free to use the mouse or you know if you're a left-handed person you just you know use the other hand but you can do that using one hand and still navigate on the mouse if if uh, uh, you're into that so i think that might um, uh, be be helpful all right so um Let's move on. Let me actually just uh, activate a poll now on this uh, Slido thing. What keyboard are you typing on? I'm interested. So um, if you uh, follow that Slido link, you can like 
uh, join in uh, joining some polls. And I would continue with uh, next one here. Um, I'm eager to learn more about the Linux command line. Which commands and piping features do you think we have to know? Yes, so the command line, that's a cool one. And here you see in the preview some, some piping uh, stuff that's going on. Uh, to be honest, uh, just, you know, what works for you. So I don't, I wouldn't say, um, you know, there are a lot of things you should, you know, learn in order to get started because it's um, really, you, you can start with the most basic things and then see what, what works for you. So hopefully the videos gave you some inspiration, you know, what you could use. And then in general, uh, typically, I mean, I'm, I'm using the command line now for a long time and every every time I do something new, I learn something new. So typically what I do, I just Google on, you know, how to do X on Unix command line. And then there's typically a command line tool that just does it for you. It, whether it's, you know, like all the basic stuff like JSON formatting or YAML formatting as well. You can uh, pipe in some JSON and then search for a specific um, substructure and then use it. And even, you know, interesting things like there's a quit Twitter client, there's a Gmail client. So, you know, you can pipe something into and write an email or whatever. And um, this is this is really uh, interesting. Or, you know, like doing things like um, batch processing on converting images or converting uh, audio and video. This is what I'm sometimes um, using just because it's faster and then you can batch job process uh, your things. So I would actually just say you don't have to, you know, much, especially when it comes to piping features, I also don't know that many, you know, besides, you know, the obvious like grep or something like that. Uh, but, you know, once you go to AWK or uh, K or what's the name or uh, X, X arcs, it's, it's quite sophisticated. So, you know, like it's uh, don't get confused on, on, on that. I would say if it's already helpful, just using some basic commands then just start from there. And the more you use it, um, you know, the better you become. So I think that's the most uh, important on, on that one. Um, I hope um, that's uh, that's helpful. So. Um, Let's move on here. I like your ideas of making the US OS usage more productive. Unfortunately, I have to use Windows at work. Are there any tips to make that better? Uh, yes. So with Windows, actually, I was in, uh, in a similar position a few times uh, because uh, I was a consultant for uh, many years and I still do some consultant work uh, where sometimes you just have to use what's given in the project and that might be uh, Windows or, you know, whatever. Uh, what I put together for myself is a basic uh, survival toolkit that I can use on, on Windows uh, consisting of a baboon uh, shell, baboon uh, shell, um, or I don't even know if that's the most advanced one. I uh, fortunately don't uh, use Windows that often. So this one or a Sigwin shell, that is a shell that emulates um, um, a Unix shell, um, I think even C shell, uh, this one and um, has a Git client and things like that. Oh, what's another one is actually the Git shell. So if you download Git for Windows, including the shell, then it comes with a, a Unix shell. That's quite, you know, like sophisticated. At least you can also do some batch uh, scripting and things like that. So I actually d uh, did that as well when I had to prepare some stuff with automation on a Windows computer. I was actually using either Baboon or Git, uh, um, Git shell, Git bash, that's the name, Git bash. Um, to execute bash scripts rather than uh, doing, you know, the batch scripts on uh, on Windows, just because that's much easier for me. Uh, this is what I will use then. And also what I use, uh, I think I talked about it in the course, um, I use a keyboard layout where I have the escape uh, key remap to caps lock or the other way around caps lock remap to escape. And I use the same on Windows. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Actually, you have to do some registry hacking and admin rights. It's, it's really crazy in order to change the keyboard layout to a custom layout because that's not supported in Windows. But that is then possible as well um, to get um, the one with a special escape key there and no dead keys, US international or graphics layout. Um, yeah, it's, it's not perfect, but you know, then you can build up something um, where you're more productive. And then uh, when it comes to switching windows, like, you know, you do the alt tab and control tab probably on the windows operating system. That is okay. I mean, it's not as fast as if you would use a tiling window manager on Linux, but you know, it's doable. And then, you know, you get used to it. So at least I was using that a few times and it was okay. Uh, I survived, <laughs> I would say. 
um, I hope that that helps. So it's basically, you know, like how to get there uh, with the same experience. And then of course, all of your programs, like if, if you use uh, Vim or not, um, you can use this and uh, your IntelliJ or whatever you, uh, you use uh, with that as well. All right, so have also some questions on the chat here. Um, I purchased your course on Java E, but it's a bit more advanced. I want to know how much Java knowledge do we need to work with uh, Java EE and, and Spring? Um, I will kindly ask you, I will just answer that later because it's a diff slightly different topic to this, uh, to this session. Um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, does low profile keyboard count as mechanical? Well, if it has mechanical switches, I would say uh, yes, for I think you're referring to the to the question. Um, in general, it's just the, the, the question, you know, like what, what you um, uh, what, what you're f f familiar or what you're happy with uh, typing on, um, actually. Um, all right, let's have a look into QA um, as well. We have some questions in Slido. What do you see as uh, the advantage of mechanical keyboards? Do you use one of those keyboards with no letters, numbers, symbols, and uh, is it better? <laughs> yes, actually, well, it's on, a, it's on a cable, I cannot show it. I am using a keyboard um, uh, without a uh, description, like blank one. Um, actually, I can show you. So there's some update actually on the keyboard that I'm using. And this is just, you know, FYI, I don't, I don't get any money. I don't want some ad, uh, to do some advertising, but just, you know, you might or might not have similar experiences. So this one, uh, Dust Keyboard, um, sounds German, but it's actually American brand. Uh, uh, the Dust is the article. Um, is one that has a really good um, quality in general, I would say. It has cherry switches. I was using this a lot with the cherry brown switches. And uh, I mean, I don't care about RGB and you know, there's a lot of fancy stuff that I usually don't need. So what I was using was this one um, with, you know, blank uh, description. Actually, this is, I would say it's very, very helpful because first of all, I don't get the keyboard description thing because you know, your hands are blocking the view. You cannot read them anyway, right? So you should do touch typing. Um, second thing is if you ever change your keyboard layout, for example, if you're not a, a native English speaker, if you don't use a US keyboard layout uh, already and then you might switch, then it doesn't help you because it's just wrong. And uh, the other thing what is really helpful um, is um, the uh, digits, the digit keys, right? Because we are quite familiar, you know, with these keys, but once you have to press the digits, that really helps you because it forces you to literally learn to touch type the digits as well, right? Like which finger to use to tip, type uh, five, six, seven, and so on. And this is then really helpful to just, you know, by forcing you to get better because you cannot literally look and then you're just forcing, you just stop looking at your keyboard because it doesn't help you. Um, so I would say um, this, uh, this helps and or um, help me. And then as an advantage of mechanical keyboard, I wouldn't even necessarily, it's not even mechanical, I would say it's a keyboard with a proper quality. So I was using these first, then right now I'm using, uh, not this fancy gaming thing, but uh, Realforce Topper, this is a Japanese uh, uh, brand. It has capacitive switches. So strictly speaking, they're not even mechanical. It's like similar, I think to your phone screen, like detecting when you type. Um, really, really nice type experience. I, um, I enjoy them a lot. So this is what I'm using right now. And you know, it's again, it's not mechanical, but it's really, once you get a proper keyboard, you just feel the difference. And if you type a lot, then you know, it, it makes a huge difference, especially once you switch back, um, uh, you will believe me, that's just, uh, there's a huge um, difference there. Uh, but actually what I, and this was just yesterday, what I uh, now, uh, ordered uh, and purchased just to try it out actually is this one ultimate hacking keyboard uh, just because I was curious uh, with uh, I notice I mean now usually I'm uh, traveling a lot but now haha I'm not and I'm just uh, typing a lot here on my uh, keyboard which is right now this uh, such a real force uh, actually I can show you uh, it's this high profile uh, one for um, for typing this is where I'm literally typing on right now uh, one of these uh, here which uh, I um, enjoy a lot, this one with, um, you, you will see it has a high profile. And um, so that's, that's pretty cool. And um, I was curious to see how it is when you split it up, especially when you can use some, you know, like faster usage for the mouse. I don't use the mouse a lot or at all, but you know, then this context switch is so, so much faster than moving, uh, making this way when I now you know, use my mouse here. 
And um, that was one. And the other thing, I was really curious to see how these extra modifier keys work. So you basically have multiple layers on the keyboard already where you say, okay, you don't need a huge space bar. It's just that tiny. And then function has like something like here, like insert and things like that. And there's another modifier, I think for um, numlock or something like that. You will see the extra layout here. Um, again, I don't want to do too much advertising. I'm actually just trying it out. So it hasn't arrived yet, I cannot tell. And of course I ordered it without uh, description as well. But you, here you see it has like some cursors and things like that, which I found interesting because one thing I still have to do is to type like insert uh, for IntelliJ, for example, a few times. And you know, like some extra, like, you know, home, delete, and sometimes you have some extra keys. And if you get used to it, typing it on that, uh, that one, then I think it's faster. The reason why I didn't purchase it earlier was because I usually I travel a lot and then I use my keyboard, uh, my laptop keyboard, and it doesn't have that. And then when you switch, you know, layouts back and forth, it's confusing. But now I'm only typing on this one. So I thought, you know, why not try it out? Uh, so I hope uh, this answers that question. And um, let's continue on this. So, um, Next Slido question. Any recommendations for learning Vim shortcuts? I use it for basic editing, but always forget to use all the motion keys like moving uh, across paragraphs. Yes, so recommendations. Um, there are some uh, tutorials um, how to uh, basically how to get started with that. I, I've, I think you probably have seen some um, tutorials uh, there already uh, because you're, you know, you're asking and to, to get started. There was even I don't think I find it right now. There was some um, cheat sheet available where I can literally print it out on your wall and say, okay, these are the movement commands. And um, the thing I was using, let me show you back then, was this uh, one. This was the first uh, Vim tutorial I, I learned um, with. So it shows you, you know, the basic uh, things. But um, I think you're you're already you're already there. I recently found that one um, as well uh, as well. Uh, OpenVim.com. Um, it is an uh, interactive. Uh, tutorial that you can just do uh, online and it will show you some you know like of the movements commands as well but then on the other hand just you know again it's you know I don't think no no one of us is like a whim master where you just say okay you use all the movement command commands I certainly don't uh, you can use one which uh, you're really fast with and then once you notice that you have to make some you know like three steps in order to get somewhere you might look if there's a faster way but usually I'm you know I'm the same I use well, I use this paragraph movement a lot. I use F for find and jumping uh, a lot. And then of course, search uh, a slash uh, and then word forward, word backward, but that's mostly it. Um, you know, what I found very helpful, let me show my um, uh, editor. I wanted to show something later. So what I'm doing here is I have this relative uh, line numbering. So if you say, okay, you have, you know, you want to jump up there then it's like four up and you can jump lines up. So for example, let me show something else um, like this, for example, um, that's them. And if I say, okay, I now want to jump like here, then I typically what I say either, um, I say I, I search for this word and then jump there directly, or I say um, two lines down, which you saw on the left side with the relative line numbering and then either fa like here or like three forward so you know i'm also not an expert on that it's just like what uh what you're uh, basically fast with um i would say uh and then it's just you know look into tutorials maybe write down some of the basic movement commands at first and then try to get into them but you know the same is for me so for example i uh, recently i tried to get used to the vim surround uh plugin uh, which is basically saying if you now I want to see whether I get it um, like this. No, I think that was wrong. Um, nope. Oh, it's actually I was actually trying to do this. Okay, now it's, you, you see, I, I still have to learn it. And sometimes it works, but then I don't use it. The problem is if you don't use it often enough to get used to it, then there's the issue. So sometimes you just might force yourself to learn it a little bit to then become faster uh, later on. But you know, it's same for me. I don't have like a big uh, recommendations there rather than first of all, in order to know what is out there, look into some tutorials. I think this one is quite interesting as well. And then it's basically, you know, trying to get, get used to it, uh, I would say. Um, follow up question. Don't you get frustrated when you don't know where a symbol is? Do you have a, a keyword? Uh, 
button map open to check um it's uh, i would say it's okay i got frustrated a little bit it was oh god i think at least six years ago or something like that when i switched from the german keyboard layout to the uh, u.s english one i got um then because every uh, special character like the curly braces is different and uh, that can be a little bit frustrating with the numbers it's okay because you're usually like you know off by one uh, only because you know it's kind of um uh, you kind of know where they are um, it's it's not super frustrating. It's more like helpful um, to learn them. I don't have a cheat sheet next to me. I will actually. That's I already thought about this. Uh, if I use such a layout where you have a different layer where it's you know it's not obvious when you say okay maybe these are obvious but then insert and delete and whatever where they are. I will definitely you know need to look that up if you have a keyboard without a uh, description. Uh, then I probably will do this for just uh, for the time being. Um, but also, you know, I, I think I won't get used to all of them or, or whatever, but, you know, the most uh, important ones, I guess. So this is what I would do. Yeah, if, if it helps you, sure, then just uh, lay something next to you. But uh, the idea should be that you really get, get used to it, I would say. All right. Is anything of your open uh, OS setup scripts config Z shell plugins open source? Would be nice to check out your profile. Yes, it is. Um, and actually, I got another follow-up question on that. Where is it? Dot files here on GitHub uh, slash no dot files um, are not super up to date because actually I'm using a different setup for multiple reasons and it includes some like private keys and stuff. Uh, but I was sharing that and that's basically uh, the most important ones like, you know, aliases and, you know, some scripts with uh, my Vim setup and what I use for some like integration of, of Z shell. I use all my Z shell and then you here you find some custom things like, you know, um, how to do some basic shortcuts. Um, and then when it comes to aliases or anything else, it really depends um, what you use. So I would say um, I, I want to share them for inspiration more like, but I would say the biggest benefit is if you, you know, uh, like I said earlier, take the step back and reflect what you are using because you will use totally different tools than I do. And sometimes uh, maybe I have aliases that you use once in Blue Moon and then, you know, it doesn't make sense to, for you to have an alias, but you have different commands to say, okay, what is it actually that I'm using the whole time? And this is also how I'm advancing. There's some tech that I use so rarely that it doesn't make sense to, you know, like um, add some scripts or alias. But then if it's more often, then I'm like, okay, now I'm typing this command a lot. I actually will define an alias. And especially aliases for me, that's that's like a lot. I have, you will see many, many, many of them. You can check out this uh, repository and, you know, like cube control, Docker and all these things, uh, Istio and, you know, I use a bunch of clouds now, of course, also the uh, IBM cloud mostly. So because I use it mostly, I, I have um, uh, shortcuts for them, not for the other ones. It's, it's really just like what you use uh, uh, most of the time, um, I would say. So that is open source. Yes, and I got another question. Can you share your uh, IntelliJ live templates? Yes, I have not shared them uh, already. Um, I will. So I will uh, put uh, something uh, up tomorrow or so. Um, but actually, same story. If you if you go to IntelliJ uh, here, just look into you know what you're constantly using all the time. And for me, a big um, insight was to see okay, actually, it also makes sense even for imports to write a, a live template for you. So because I'm I'm typing you know these things like uh, JaxRS at path so often. So now you didn't see it. It was like ph for path and then a tab, and it also does the import. So the annoying thing for me is not to type the app path, but basically to say, okay, you know, which import to choose and things like that. And it's just so much quicker to say, okay, I know it will be uh, at inject, so just inject it, right? And, uh, you know, that is th then really just depending on what you're using all the time. So what I recently defined a lot were uh, things like, you know, at transactional, I use this a lot, application scoped uh, and Quarkus or any EE app, uh, things like that, that I just type all over again. Of course, not, not, not for all of them, but for the most frequent ones. And it's not a big deal to say, okay, at request scope, I have to, uh, to type this myself. But, you know, it's much more about what you're using all the time. Um, but I will share them as well. You can have a look into um, these for IntelliJ. And yes, of course, they're open source. And all right, let's move on. I will just put on another um, poll here. What is your favorite Unix command line command, uh, 
command line command. I'm, I'm curious. That's a word cloud. You can just type in something. And let's move on with the questions here in Slido. Um, it's actually much more interaction that I, that I thought in the beginning. That's really cool. I'm, I'm really happy for that. And um, let's look into the YouTube chat. Yeah. So, um, do you do any kind of physical automation to help your work? What do you mean physical automation? Like making coffee, dimming the lights. Oh, um, dimming lights, interesting. Um, I don't know if that helps. I would say the other way around, otherwise I get sleepy. But um, making coffee, yes. So <laughs> caffeine is like my, yeah, uh, it's definitely my drug. I actually have to limit it to not have too much coffee, uh, especially here when I'm at home because there's a coffee machine available. And um, that is something, um, physical automation, I. I wouldn't call it that way, but basically um, what I also said in, the, in another video course, just trying to, um, you know, find ways for your mental health and your mental way be, uh, well-being and also physical way of well-being when it comes to nutrition or sports where you're more um, productive because you will see a, a difference, especially when you're um, working from home now, for example, and you have a lot of time or, or not, or, you know, it depends on the uh, energy levels during your day. So pay attention to those. If you say, for example, in the morning, you're much more, you know, you're much more productive than in the afternoon or you have this typical uh, uh, hanger after after lunch, for example, then just try to build your day around that to say, okay, it actually doesn't make sense to work in the non-productive time after lunch. So I just take a longer break and then work uh, some more later on, for example. So this is what I do a lot. Yes, I try to optimize that just to see, okay, it does not work. It doesn't make sense to, to work in the non-productive time anyway. Um, so uh, I would say, um, yeah, that, that is maybe something. Uh, when it comes to other physical stuff like here, um, the lighting is, is pretty okay in this, this room, I would say. So nothing that um, would blur my screen. That is actually a big one. I would love to work outside more, but it's always like distracts my screen and the sun and I just cannot do that. So that's uh, why I always almost uh, inside. Uh, that is one, yes. And then, of course, when it comes to noise or distractions, uh, right now, luckily not at all, but usually that are just trying to, you know, um, noise canceling headphones, uh, earplugs work a lot, uh, work well for me, and then just uh, things like that. Um, I would say that's, uh, uh, that's helpful. All right. So let's have a look at some uh, more questions here. And coffee, yes. <laughs> Um, some more question here on GitHub. Uh, what are your thoughts on VS Code versus IntelliJ? Depends on your personal preference, a task and or language. Um, yes and yes. Actually, I have to say I haven't used VS Code a lot. And it's, um, it's not that um, you're well, I, I would say, you know, don't use it or something. It's just like I'm super, super happy with IntelliJ and I don't miss much. Um, I know that VS Code really, really improved, the, um, especially Java support. So apparently in the beginning it wasn't uh, that great, but um, now I would say that is uh, that is pretty good, at least from what I see. I, I know a lot of people who use it. Um, but then for me, the biggest advantage for IntelliJ for Java is, of course, all the language support and the refactoring support. Uh, so um, I have yet to see an IDE that just works better, at least for now. Um, that's why I use it. And then, of course, if you know you get used to all of the extra shortcuts and um, things that you're using, like which um, which key to press for the refactoring action, then it's also some buy-in, some investment that you make in you know new knowing these IDE, and then it's just so much more effort to to switch. Um, I would say, language it depends. So um, I recently did a little bit more uh, of JavaScript for some front end stuff, and even there I was actually surprised how well that works in IntelliJ. Um, so I had uh, was really really good support there um, on you know like all the things that you know from from Java as well. I actually um, expected that to be better in VS Code, uh, but other than that, it's um, I would say more a personal preference. So whatever, at least as you're not missing something, then it really depends what you what you prefer more. What I would look into, um, especially if you use one uh, of the other, just um, um, on purpose, trying to switch it. A little bit might might be for a side project or on you know 
uh, at the end of the day or whatever um, just to to look into it to see maybe there's some you know like features or uh, you can even watch some what I sometimes do some uh, product videos where they show you so and so many tips and tricks you know and there's al always you know something you did not know about like uh, same for IntelliJ and um, just to get some inspiration this is what I would do and uh, then basically to see uh, whether all of the required things are available. So what is really required for me is this Vim uh, plugin here. So I use IdeaVim uh, for that. I'm pretty, pretty sure that that's available in VS Code as well. I know for all of the other things like um, NetBeans, Eclipse, and you know all of the IDE support that's, and I'm pretty sure VS Code should have a uh, Vim um, emulation as well. And then it's really just personal preference, I would say. And language maybe. So I would say IntelliJ is especially um, strong for Java and yeah then I, I kind of comment much more on that. Just see, you know, what, what works for you, basically. Let me just refresh that real quick. Okay, that's all here for now. You have some, uh, what's your favorite command? rm-rf, <laughs> yeah, that's a dangerous one. sudo apt-get install, um, sl, yes, sl, um, find, grab, and so on and so forth. Yeah, find and grab is a really good one. Once you get used to that, I. I enjoy that um, as well. Some more question. What are your main reasons to not use some standard Ubuntu setup or something like that? And which areas is the usage of Ubuntu less productive for you? Yeah, so Ubuntu and myself, that is a sad story, I would say, or uh, an interesting story. Um, I, was, I was actually using Ubuntu, um, oh God, probably eight years ago or longer than that, uh, I guess. And I was pretty happy with that. I was using it actually as a second computer, which was a super old computer, but then it was perfect for uh, performance reasons to uh, run Linux and just to you know do some browsing and basic stuff. And I switched from uh, I switched from uh, Ubuntu once they introduced. I think uh, it's the name is Unity, right? Like this uh, this UI where you have the taskbar on the left that that never. Uh, I always like you know found it crazy and it, it I totally didn't like it at all and then also it uh, messed with the keyboard uh, shortcuts a bit like um, uh, it it was colliding with some IntelliJ shortcuts I think like Control Alt and whatever uh, to switch stuff and I was like okay this doesn't work for me and um, then I tried a few things um, I think Linux Mint even and then I went to Arch Linux <laughs> while I was studying computer science so. I once uh, heard somebody saying, okay, it's an um, operating system from computer scientists for computer scientists, or actually from computer science students for computer science students. So just, you know, in the beginning, you will cry setting it up because there's so much stuff to tweak and to uh, set up just to get it up and running. But now it's more like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm using it. I'm happy with it. Actually, what I would uh, say for me is more important is the window manager I'm using like this, you know, like I free th uh, thing where I can just like move things around. And then it's really not much left for the operating system rather than, you know, like package management and whatever, uh, because everything else I'm using is really, really basic. So when I install the computer, it's like literally nothing on there. And then I start with i3 and, you know, the most important programs. And then I run things like my doc files um, and shell scripts to just install everything. But that is just, you know, basic Linux uh, programs. So I'm not actually using much operating system capabilities. And everything I, I do here from even, you know, some keyboard configuration, it's all like Linux configuration. It's it's not really something, you know, operating system specific. So with uh, what you use, um, Pacman, that's the package manager for Arch Linux. And also, you know, I know which packages are available and things like that and, you know, how to build them. So I would say right now I'm just really used to it and it's totally, totally works for me. It's super stable and I'm happy. So there's nothing, no reason to switch. Um, I know a lot of people who are happy with uh, Ubuntu. Um, I would just say I, I don't like the... Um, um, graphical layout of course you could switch the window manager and everything so you know then there's no issue as well but I didn't found that like too you know productive or working for me actually but once I would switch that you know to to i3 then it's probably you know similar I guess so that's the reason uh, when if all other questions are done can you briefly tell us about a uh, developer advocate um, sure um, I, I did do a blog post uh, a while ago, but yeah, sure, why not? Because I think we're almost done with the questions here. Um, let me just refresh uh, this again so there's no more question there. Let me have a look into the YouTube chat and all these. Um, 
another Java question in the YouTube chat. Is there a problem of using request scope with bulkhead? Uh, you said it must be, I said it must be application scoped. Oh yeah, that's a Java question uh, or a, a micro profile um, JE question. Um, it's basically, just to very quickly answer that, you can um, ask me on Twitter if it's uh, too short. Um, it's basically saying if you, uh, if you have a bean that needs to be, it needs to be reused in order to do, um, you're asking for a bulkhead. Well, it's not available here. And the bulkhead basically, um, well, would configure something similar to a thread pool, depends how you set it up. And then it's only there for this bean because it's application scope. If I make request scope out of it, then this is nice that you set it up, but afterwards, you know, the bean is gone. And then, you know, you don't have the effect. You're basically creating, you know, a new thing and not the actual bulkhead that you would uh, like to do. So it's more about the state of this bean where you define things. And then you typically, uh, depend really depends what you're doing and you typically want to have one bean where you set this up once like you know th that will be an application scoped one uh, i hope that answers your question but it's a little bit off, off topic for this session um, what part of vim uh, do you use an idea i use idea hotkeys a lot when i'm trying to switch for embedded vim plugin but i think that i miss my everyday hotkeys in vim layout um good point let me see you can see this somewhere right like here yes uh settings yes um, that's the, oh, it's, it's a little bit small. Um, uh, that's the Vim emulation. As you, you might see it, it's actually everything is set to IDE, uh, except um, shift and enter because I have a remapping in Vim. But all of the other things with control um, are basically IDE, uh, IDE features uh, because I, um, I have the same thing, like, you know, I don't really switch uh, what I'm using here because it would just be confusing for me. I say, okay, it's always the same setup. And then when I'm here in my Vim setup, I almost never use control wh while I'm using Vim. Um, actually, the only uh, exception here is control S for safe, but I don't need that in IntelliJ. So all of the control features are IDE features for me. And then I get the best of both worlds, I would say, because I can use, you know, all of these, you know, control, alt, V and B for extract all these things in, in the IDE. And I use the Vim movement. So to answer your question, I almost exclusively use Vim movement uh, in uh, idea to basically, you know, like jump around and do this, you know, searching and F and whatever um, to be faster. But then for typing or almost all the editing things I, I use IntelliJ, you know, like in the uh, insert mode. And once you're in the insert mode, you know, you can do all the um, normal um, IntelliJ stuff. So that's, that's what I'm using there. Um, sometimes, yeah, the Vim idea of Vim setup breaks a little bit with new, like new pl uh, plugin version of it. And then, you know, you have to see what works. So it's not, I'm not a hundred percent happy as I can be, but it, it's, it's totally, you know, the most productive setup for me. So I'm, I'm happy with how it works basically. Uh, do you prefer mechanical p keyboard over membrane? Yes, of course. Over membrane, definitely. So these are typically the ones that ship with your computer. Um, right now I'm using a capacitive uh, switch keyboard. If you haven't seen it before, that's uh, one of these, um, a Real Forest Topper uh, keyboard, um, a Japanese brand. So that's a, technically it's not mechanical, it's a capacitive switch, but basically you want a switch that, you know, like has a proper uh, quality and a proper typing experience. I would say that is just uh, important um, for now. All right, so Let's do one more question on uh, I, I3 here and then um, see this and I have another poll for you and then I will tell you about uh, what you ask about this um, IBM experience. So last poll, how much do you have to use your mouse while uh, programming? Have a look into Slido. I also thought about using i3. Is there something tricky to set up or keep in mind before using it? Do it does it work well with multiple monitors? Um, anything tricky to set up. It's a little bit confusing in the beginning because it tries to, you know, fit all of your windows into this grid layout, whether or not it makes sense. And especially if you have um, a floating window, uh, floating windows are, are these ones, you can actually switch it. So it does work to have something, you know, that float, uh, floats uh, around. Uh, but, you know, when, for example, you start up your IDE and then it shows this window, then it will just per default, try to fix that into the grid layout, which just looks a little bit weird. You can uh, just have, you know, have a look at these as it's shift super and then uh, space to switch that mode um, where you can break out of this mode. Other than that, it's 
not really some things will look weird but then you know you will use uh you will get you into it it does work uh very well actually with multiple monitors there's another um thing how to switch the multiple monitors i only use one so i don't know it i think it's control alt uh super and then left right or this one I'm, I'm not quite sure but you can switch them which one is active and there are some others that i use just to be faster and but this can be found in my doc files there's this i3 um, config and then i have some that i use most of the time but basically switching left right for um, the workspace for the window itself and i think for the window on container or something like that. So I, I hacked together just, you know, like a few, you know, like uh, a few um, shortcuts here. You can have a look into these, but yeah, this one. I don't use them at all because I have a single monitor right now. Uh, actually, that's the most productive setup for me. I have a monitor that it's, it's not quite 4K. It's like in the middle between 4K and a full HD, but it's a one-to-one -one pixel layout. So it's, you know, big and very small pixel uh, or font size. And then, you know, you have a lot of space. You basically can, you know, have two IDEs next to each other. And then I don't need a second screen. I just, you know, if I want to see two things at a time, I just uh, put them um, in this mode, basically, to say, you know, here, left, right. And typically, you know, it's a small font size, like like this roughly. So now you don't see it on the video. But, um, you know, then I can just move around and I have enough space. And that's also here. It's only full uh, HD, what you see. So usually it's also bigger. Uh, so I actually don't use a second monitor, but it does work with uh, with i3 use. So you can have a look into that. All right. Um, uh, what bad have you grown into ever since using Vim? What What do you mean with bad? I don't uh, I don't get it. Quite the um, question. Maybe you can reform. What bad have you grown into ever since? Oh, you mean which skill? Oh, so I'm, I would say I'm not a Vim expert, but I, I use Vim like all the time and I need it for my, uh, for my typing experience. And as I uh, told you in the course, I, you know, even type emails in Vim. So it's like, uh, I really need that, uh, for, for this experience. Okay. Let me have one more look at the, um, GitHub issue. Okay. Perfect. So another thing I want to announce, um, you probably have seen it. Um, I started a podcast actually on this topic in general, how to be more efficient and effective as a developer. Um, you can have a look at this uh, blog post announcement and it's uh, available for free on Anchor FM or Spotify and a few other platforms, uh, whatever. That's this one, the effective developer. And um, yeah, I really enjoy this topic and uh, also to give a little bit more background on the flow experience and what that means. It's a lot about, you know, mindsets and how to get into basically the best experience to, to program. Uh, because I think it's just the best best job ever that we're doing. And yeah, I'm uh, really excited about about that. And then, yep, that's uh, everything here on this site. Then let me now answer that uh, question on that you had on the uh, IBM site. So how I got into um, yeah developer advocate. Uh, basically, the story is I was doing a lot of um, uh, outreach, uh, you know, type of work for um, for the Java community mostly. So basically, teaching uh, developers how to do things mostly related to enterprise Java and giving uh, conference presentations and you know traveling around for Java user groups and meetups. Uh, I was a consultant at that time, so self-employed as a freelancer, and um, this worked uh, really well. Uh, but then at some point, it was just a question. Um, basically what to spend your time on, right? Because if you uh, have your own business, then ultimately you also need to uh, earn some money. Uh, and then it was just a question, okay, uh, what is the best, um, you know, like balance uh, to do that? And I noticed I really, really enjoy um, doing all of the, you know, developer advocacy type of work, like speaking at a conference or, you know, doing things like this here. Um, for me, that's just uh, great. So for now, I really, uh, really enjoy this. Uh, and then I basically, yeah, looked into, uh, well, type of uh, jobs or roles where, where that is available, where that is possible. Uh, and then for the background and the tech I was uh, using um, in the past already, you know, like enterprise Java and cloud native stuff and all of the, you know, like enterprisey things, um, IBM really, really made sense. So my role is also officially called um, um, advocate for Java. So lead Java developer advocate, uh, that's the official title. And um, that I think, you know, it's, it's just super cool because you, you know, you can create things, you can share knowledge on all kinds of platforms. 
right now not so many conferences of course and no traveling anymore uh, for now but um, I think it's just you know a great way to also teach yourself because in order to um, educate others uh, teaching is a great uh, a way to to learning for yourself and I, I really really enjoy that and um, yeah, I'm super, super happy uh, also with uh, with the position and to be honest, also with IBM a lot. I mean, you know, it's you, you can say a lot of things about uh, big organizations, but I would say it really, really depends uh, where you end up, like, you know, in which organization and uh, which team and whatever. And uh, all of the colleagues are just really awesome, um, really um, very knowledgeable engineers and uh, awesome people. So I'm super happy to uh, to work with them. And now also with the um, uh, colleagues from Red Hat, the same. Uh, can um, that I can say and yeah that's just uh, has been really really fun so far it's um, one and a half years for now yeah all right then uh, thanks um, a lot now um, I would say oh bad habits that was the question bad habits um, have you grown into ever since using Vim um, to answer that one last question basically yeah, not only the bad habit that now I need to vim vimify all of the environments so whenever I type into an editor if it's not a vim emulation or vim typing experience I, I really like you know I curse a little bit or sometimes I switch to vim and then copy paste it into because if you type more than just you know typing out one sentence that's okay but once you have to edit something and jump around then you really miss the vim typing experience and that's probably the baddest uh, habit uh, I have but other than that you know with the setup I just quickly switch to win so that's you know that's um, I would say doable all right um, then uh, thanks a lot for attending um, I really really enjoyed that, were, that there were many uh, many questions on this topic so then you know I would do um, I like to do this for other topics as well actually if you're especially interested in and one topic, you know, where I was sharing some content in the past, like, you know, if you want a special of these live QAs of some particular things, you know, last time we had testing, now this one, uh, let me know, actually, uh, reach out on Twitter or any other platform. And uh, until then, please stay safe in this time. And thanks a lot for watching. Bye.